to say. <laughs> Particularly how much far travel I do, I'm sure the NSA has some monitoring device. Actually, my latest book is not Equal is Unfair because I just came up with a new one about three weeks ago. It's called The Wealth Creators, The Mall Case for Finance. So it's a book where I defend, defend bankers, hedge fund guys, private equity, all the villains of, uh, of the modern world. So um, I'll be talking about that on Monday for the Adam Smith Institute here in London. So uh, you, can look at, you can look up the... the uh, Information about the talk on the Adam Smith Institute website. It says it's sold out. Just call them and say you want to come. And tell them I said it's okay. <laughs> At least we can try, right? So, one of the great uh, injustices probably ever committed by mankind is the way we treat entrepreneurs and businessmen. I mean, think about what entrepreneurs have achieved. And you've all seen the, the, the graph of, of income per capita or wealth per capita from 10,000 years ago, right? It, it, for 10,000 years, it goes like this. It's kind of flat. This is wealth per capita, income per capita, same thing. You know, it goes up a little bit, maybe during Rome, and then it goes down a little bit during the dark ages, and generally, and then it goes like that, like that. And if you look about who does that, who, who makes that happen? I mean, at the end of the day, that wealth that's being created, for the first time in human history, we can see wealth being created. We went from zero sum, where it's just static, nothing's happening, nobody's creating really anything. Everything's zero sum. If you're wealthy, it's because what? How do you become wealthy? You should know this in England. Heritage, yeah, but how did the heritage start? Colonial. What's that? Colonial, like, Colonial, even before colonials, the aristocrats in England before colonial times. How did they get their money? The contracts. What's that? Contracts. Good timing. Merchants. Good timing, merchants. Wow, you guys are so optimistic. <laughs> they stole it. <laughs> they were good at exploiting other people. They were good, they, they, had, uh, they had more political savvy in sucking up to the king. They, uh, they had uh, more ability to, to round up peasants to be their serfs. But aristocrats are nothing but very sophisticated thieves throughout Europe because everything they engaged in was zero sum. There was no real creativity, there was no creation of wealth. It's one of the reasons I think Europeans are so skeptical about wealth and about wealth creation and about rich people, much more so than Americans. Because you have this long heritage in which 95% of the population was basically being exploited by a small group of people. They accumulated relative to the time vast sums of money at other people's expense. And you've never really gotten over that. Whereas America started basically with nothing, third-rate colony, that's why they got their independence, you guys didn't really fight, right? And yet, within 140 years, became what? The most powerful economy in the world. Why? How did that happen? 
How did England get the wealth that it got? How did life expectancy go through the roof? How did we attain all that during the 19th and then again during the 20th century? No change in human wealth for 10,000 years until the Industrial Revolution. And who makes the Industrial Revolution possible? It's businessmen, it's engineers, it's scientists, it's entrepreneurs. So it's people taking the ideas of science and applying them to creating values for people to consume. That's what entrepreneurs do. They find new ways to create new values that we are all willing or interested in consuming and willing to pay for them more than what it costs the entrepreneur to make it. So what entrepreneurs really do is they find profit opportunities. The genius of entrepreneurship is to find profit opportunities that didn't exist before. And by doing so, they create massive amounts of values of things that make our lives astronomically better. They raise the standard of living and everybody, at least everybody is willing to work in society. Everybody who's willing to be engaged in the trade of value in society is better off because of the work of entrepreneurs and businessmen. Everything we have around us is a consequence ultimately of some wealth creator at some point building, making, creating from the steam engine on here in England, in all of Europe, and today, of course, in the Far East. So, so this graph, right, where income and wealth don't change, stayed that way in Asia for how, until when? Right? They stayed. You know what level this is? What level did people live on for those 10,000 years? Poverty. Yeah, subsistence, what is that? Poverty line. Poverty line, yeah, yeah, they wish they were today's poverty line. What was, the, what, was the, what was the income per capita 300 years ago in Europe? Dollars. Yeah, it's under $3 a day. In today's dollars, like McDonald's would have wiped you out, like a Big Mac would have wiped your income for the whole day. I mean, think about, think about what that really means, because it's in today's dollars. Say any one of you think about what you could do with three dollars. And you can do more today with three dollars, partially because there's so much available today. Back then there was nothing. So most people lived, they grew their food, and they ate it. That was it. Very little surplus, very little ability to trade, almost no ability to create wealth until this amazing revolution that happens in the late 18th century, where wealth is suddenly created. The human mind is suddenly unleashed. We are able, we, we for the first time really, are able to start whatever business we want, work wherever we want, create whatever we want, trade with whoever who's willing to trade with us. And when we give people that kind of freedom, entrepreneurs, business people, take advantage of that and create and produce and make and build. <coughs> and yet, when, uh, you know, when we look at our history and when we look at who we honor and who we respect and who we admire in our history, who we built statues for, who we name streets after, it's not the people who create and build and make. So who do, who do, we, who do we tend to honor? We love generals. We love politicians. Now, generals and politicians are important. But generals and politicians are not the people who created the 20th century. They're not the people who created the wealth that we all enjoy. They're not the people who made possible life expectancy of 84. Well, mid-80s that we enjoy today. They're not the people who brought us out of subsistence farming and to the point today where we live amazing life by any standard. 
by any historical standard. So that projection of wealth per capita or income per capita is a consequence of entrepreneurs and businessmen who we don't honor. We don't even know their names. We certainly don't call boulevards after them. And in the United States, anybody know what in America we call those businessmen who in the 19th century built the country, made the country, created the wealth that everything that we enjoy today in America is based on? Robert Barons. Robert Barons. Robert Barons. We call them the same name that was attributed to, justifiably, to the aristocrats in Europe pre-industrial revolution. Robber barons. Barons aristocrat, robber thief. Yes, they were robber barons. But they were the aristocratic class of Europe. They were not the industrialist class of America. So the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Mellons and J.P. Morgans, and you have in England and every country that has developed has the equivalent of those people. And in modern times, it would be the Bill Gates's and the Jobs and the Harry Ellison's of the world, the people who actually create, build, make. So why is it? Why do we, why do we have so little respect for these people? Now, it, today, we kind of admire the high-tech entrepreneurs. We kind of think they're cool. But at the end of the day, they're not gonna, we, we don't remember them as, as giants. Nobody's building statues of Steve Jobs. It ain't happening, right? There was a movie that tried to portray him as ugly as possible, right? We want to rip him down. There are no streets named after Steve Jobs as much as we love Apple. So the, 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 probably the most admirable, admired entrepreneur of the last 50 years is Steve Jobs. And a few weeks after he died, there were all these editorials about what a nasty person he was and how he didn't give charity, how Apple never gave charity while he was alive. So even the most admired of them, we have to have caveats in. So what is it that protect, prevents us from really <coughs> giving them their due, from fully respecting and admiring and celebrating the people who create the material world in which we live. What is entrepreneurship about? Why do people do it? Why do people become entrepreneurs? To make money, that's one obvious reason, right? If you're good at it, you make a lot of money. To put their ideas into reality. What's that? To put their ideas into reality. Yeah, they want to put their ideas into reality. They have a passion, they have a love for, for, for the thing that they are doing. You know, Steve Jobs, you know, loved making beautiful things. He loved creating. He loved building. So he went to work every day because he had a passion for this. And he wanted to make a lot of money. Partially because making a lot of money is a sign that you're doing what? A good job. Right? Making a lot of money means you're creating values. Making a lot of money means people value what you are doing. Because why would anybody pay, what are the new iPhones selling for? $1,000. So why would anybody pay $1,000 for an iPhone? It looks pretty. Because it's pretty? All right. Because it's worth more than $1,000 to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't pay $1,000 for it. So your life is better off for having an iPhone than, it, than, it, than if you didn't have it. So the money is a sign that people really value the work that you do. That people really like are getting better because of the work that you do. And plus, you know, it's fun to have a lot of money, you know, for lots of reasons. So why did Steve Jobs become an entrepreneur? For whom did Steve Jobs become an entrepreneur? For himself. Steve Jobs was about Steve Jobs. Bill Gates is about Bill Gates. Larry Ellison is about Larry Ellison. What's his name uh, at Uber? What's his name? 
Ryan, is it Ryan? I can't show. What's that? Did you say Uber? Uber. I forget his first name. Travis. 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 Thank you. Travis is about Travis. Yeah, Travis is particularly about Travis. Uh, <laughs> Travis is a character. Entrepreneurs go into the business because they love it, because it fulfills them, and because they make a lot of money. It's about their selfish pursuit of their own values, of their own dreams, of what their life is about. It's why they're so passionate about it. I mean, I don't know how many of you are entrepreneurs, have worked at startups, or have, I mean, it's hard. It's unbelievable hours. It's unbelievable effort. You have to be really committed if you want to start your own business and if you want to make a success of it. And that commitment comes from the fact that they love what they're doing. That commitment comes because it's in their self-interest to do it. They're getting a reward for it, whether it's monetary or spiritual. So entrepreneurs and business people generally are obviously self-interested. They're about themselves. And what have we been taught about being self-interested since we were this big? That's wrong. Yeah, that's bad, right? Really bad. I know what your mother's taught you. My mother taught me, good Jewish mother, <laughs> to be selfless. Think about this first. Think of yourself last. Eat lots. What's that? Eat lots. Eat lots? Yeah. <laughs> no, she taught, no, it works the other way around. You got you to finish everything on your plate. Why? Not because it's good for you. Because they're starving children in fill in the blank. I can date when you were born based on the country your mother used. My mother used Biafra. That's why you can tell I was growing up in the late 60s and early 70s, right? And there was Bangladesh, right? Yeah, Biafra and Bangladesh. Right, so she's not going to use a, a motivation that you should eat your food because it's good for you. No. Right? The whole idea is, the whole idea of ethics, the whole idea of morality, the whole idea of how, what they want to teach you is what's good for them. And you're going to eat this because otherwise they will starve somehow. <laughs> Never made any sense to me. Right? One of those things your parents say and you go, all right, they're not as smart as I thought they were. <laughs> but the whole notion of morality that we are taught, the whole notion of ethics, is to be selfless, to sacrifice, to think of other people first, not to think of yourself, not to pursue your passion, not to try to make as much money as you can. Indeed, profit, the word profit, the concept of profit, is deemed negatively in our culture. Because you are profiting. It's a selfish term. It's about an individual making money off of, supposedly, other people. Hey, you could have given the product away for free. Or you could have had a smaller margin. How dare Apple have 40% margins when they fall? or 50% or whatever the margin is. That's just, what's the word? Greed. Greedy. Right? So we're taught from very young to be suspicious of anything that smacks from selfishness, from self-interest. Indeed, what are we taught selfishness means? What does selfishness mean? If you look it up in the dictionary. Exploiting others for... Yeah, so it's always about exploiting others. So the definition of, of, of self-interest should be something like taking care of self or placing one's own interest as primary, right? Placing one's own interest as primary, and then there's a comma, at the expense of others, right? And it's at the expense of others. Where did that come from? Why at the expense of others? Why can't we keep it the first two? Taking care of self or, you know, pursuing one's own interests. It's a taking care of, it's the, it's exploiting others that we've been really drilled into us. We've been told that the two options in morality, being selfless 
or being an SOB? <laughs> being selfless or exploiting other people? Those are the two options. And as a consequence, the whole way in which we think about businessmen and entrepreneurs is distorted and perverted. So, you know, I, I like to use Bill Gates as an example because people love to hate it. But Bill Gates made 70, I don't know, $5 billion or something. I think he's the second richest man in the world these days because I'm Jeff Bezos, who's just, you know, uh, is now worth more than Bill Gates. Partially because Bill Gates doesn't work anymore. Imagine if Bill Gates just kept on working. So Bill Gates made 75, how do you make $75 billion? Some of you have heard this before. How do you make $75 billion? How do you become a billionaire? I mean, this is a secret. It's worth coming to this day just to hear this. Right? How do you make a billion dollars? Create value, but not just any value. Lots of people create value. Create more than a billion. Yeah, but how do you do that? What, what does it take to create more than a billion dollars worth of value? The interconnectivity of this industry. So you connect people and you have the... Uh, how many people do you have to connect to make a billion dollars? A million people. <laughs> Well, that means your profit margin is one dollar. <laughs> How do you make a billion dollars? It's not hard, right? It should be easy. What's that? Innovate. innovate. I know a lot of innovators, a lot of good innovators who are not billionaires. Some of the greatest innovators in the world are not, are not billionaires. To make a billion dollars, you have to create something that almost everybody wants. Everybody, I mean hundreds of millions of people. Not only do they want it, they want it so badly that they're willing to pay you for it more than what it costs you to produce. And if you can take a profit and multiply that profit by hundreds of millions of people or billions of people, and if you can repeat the process over and over and over again, you're going to make billions of dollars. Absolutely. I mean, all, all innovation does that. All innovation teaches us something about how we can use our lives, our time, our energy in ways that we didn't know before. I mean, I, you know, I never wanted one of these. I didn't know what I'd do with it. Somebody had asked me, and it seems kind of silly, carrying it around all day, right? I have a computer at home. I'm connected to the internet at home in the office. Why do I need one every second of the day? It turns out I do. <laughs> I, I remember cell phones, you guys were too young, but when the first real commercial cell phones came out, not the bricks, the little ones, and uh, I said to my wife, we don't need this, this is stupid, right? we have a phone at home, we have a phone in the office, like it's, it's a 20 minute drive, it's like if you don't have a phone for 20 minutes, how big of a deal is that? So we didn't get one, and then my wife had a, she was commuting, uh, she was getting a master's degree and she was commuting and she was coming back late at night. And we decided, okay, we'll get one phone for that drive late at night just in case the car breaks down or something emergency happened. So as soon as we got that one phone, within three months, we had, everybody in the family had a phone and we were talking constantly and using them all the time. And yeah, we learned that we needed something that we had no clue we needed. And this is what's really meant by Production creates its own demand, right? When, when, peop when people, when, when great entrepreneurs create something new, the demand comes. It's not that they're fulfilling a demand. There is no demand. There is no demand for cell phones before their cell phones. The demand is created when the cell phone arrives and we realize its value. So, Steve, so Bill Gates made billions of dollars by changing the world by making the world a better place, by improving the lives of hundreds of millions of people, actually billions. I don't know that there's a human being on the planet that was not touched by something Microsoft did. It was so interconnected. It was so part of the world in which we lived. So even if you're poor and have never touched a computer, the aid that you're getting is being logistically you know, controlled 
and efficiently delivered to you at a low cost so you can get more of it by a product of Microsoft somewhere down the chain. Nobody on the planet was not touched and made better by Microsoft. And yet, we don't have statues, no roads named after Bill Gates. We don't think of him when he was at Microsoft at least as this incredibly good person. Yeah, he's an admired businessman that we study in business school. Now, when did, when did uh, Bill Gates become an okay guy? Kind of a good guy. Yeah, when he started saving children in Africa. He was saving children in Africa and Microsoft as well. But he had to leave Microsoft. He had to leave his job. He had to stop making money. He had to stop producing values. He had to stop being creative. And go and put all his money in a foundation and start giving it away. Now, why is that good and noble and being in Microsoft not? More tangible. He's not making any profit. What's that? Because he's not earning any profit. So at Microsoft, yes, he was helping you, but he was helping himself at the same time. So the helping you is tinged by self-interest, and therefore is no good. <coughs> Morally, it's not acceptable to make money off of helping other people, even though that's how we really help each other, is through trade. Once he went to, my, once he went to the foundation, now he's not benefiting. Now he's just giving. Now it's much purer. It's much cleaner. There's no self-interest. He's not making a profit. Now he's a good guy. Now he's still not a saint, right? Why isn't he a saint yet? He's rich. Because he's, he's still got a lot of money. Yeah, well, you don't have to die to be a saint. I guess you do technically, but, but you don't really in terms of people's attitudes. Mother Teresa was a saint before she was a saint, sainted, right? But he, he's still got money. He's still got a beautiful house. He, he seems to be enjoying the whole thing, right? I mean, he's, got, he's always, like, when he does interviews, he seems to be into it, right? Have, have you ever seen, you've been to museums here in England, right, and, and you go and see the paintings of saints? Have you ever seen a painting of a saint with a smile on their face? <laughs> no, that defeats the purpose. You're not supposed to be happy as a saint. You're supposed to be suffering. The whole point of the morality that says your duty is to serve others, you should be selfless, is that you don't smile. Smiling is kind of a selfish activity. Smiling means you're having fun. Right? Augustine Comte, the French philosopher of the mid-19th century, who coined the term altruism, said that if you, if you think about the benefit that you're going to receive from helping other people, it taints the act, it's no longer moral. And if you're smiling, you must be enjoying what you're doing. So it can't be moral, it can't be good. So what would it take for Bill Gates to be a saint? How do we make him a saint? Give him all the uh, give away all his money and make him sad. Make him sad. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's kind of gentle. Yeah. <laughs> He's done that. Do yeah. you guys know about the giving pledge? Yeah. You know, he's gone around all of, all, to all American billionaires, uh, actually globally, and guilted them into signing the giving pledge, which says that you're going to give, I can't remember, over 50% of all your wealth at some point during your life to charity. Right. So he's already done that. Still not a saint. Still having too much fun. I mean, he'd have to give all his money away. He'd have to give... Yeah, he'd have to have some, some, something bad happen to him, right? And I think ideally, he, but, but he'd have to do it willingly, right? Because if somebody else did it to him, then yeah, that wouldn't work. He'd have to give all his money away, like leave his house, move into a tent. But what really would work is if, if he showed a little blood, right? We want to see some blood. We want to see some suffering. What's that? Yeah, if he's made that choice. Yeah, no, I think if something happened to him, they'd say, well, he didn't, he, he, the morality comes from choices, right? Accidents don't make you moral. What makes you moral is the choices you make. 
All small theories believe that, or almost all, right? So, so you know, unless you're a Calvinist or, or some sects of Protestant religion believe that you're all predetermined. So, so it's predetermined whether you go to hell or, or heaven. So it doesn't matter what you do in life. I, I don't get that theory. It's a little, it's too, too crazy for me. Um, but no, morality is about choices. So he has to make that choice, and then he becomes a good guy. Now, now think about that. Think about the, the, the injustice involved in it. Here's a person who's worked hard, and I don't know how much you've read about, about Bill Gates, but he worked unbelievably hard. From when he was a teenager, figuring out computers when they were early on, to when he started Microsoft, to figuring out all the issues that had to be involved, how to create wealth, how to create value, how to grow this business, how to make it prosper. He's applied his mind, He's had fun doing it. You get the sense with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and many of those entrepreneurs, they love it. They get a kick out of it. And then all of that, all of the wealth, all of the benefit to mankind that they've created is worthless in our minds. In terms of morality, it's worthless. And they have to give it all up somehow to be worthy. And, and you see this in the old, the people who were called Robert Barons. J.P. Morgan died miserable, filled with guilt for all the self, selfish stuff he'd done creating America, building America. And, uh, and he started giving away vast amounts of money in the hope, and he said this explicitly, in the hope of buying himself into heaven. Carnegie, Rockefeller, all of them were, were, were filled with guilt because they acted in their lives based on their self-interest. But they were taught that what's noble is to be selfless. They wanted to be Mother Teresa, not really. They knew Mother Teresa was the moral ideal that they should strive towards. But they didn't want to do it. They wanted to live their lives. And what happens inside of you when you live one life but you think the ideal is a different life? Guilt. Feelings of guilt. And most businessmen out there, maybe not when they're young, we're too busy when we're young to feel guilty. But as they age and they make the money and they're successful, they start feeling guilty. And guilt is, as every Catholic or, or, or Jewish mother will tell you, guilt is a fantastic way to manipulate people. And as politicians use it effectively. You know, if you don't raise your own taxes, those kids over there, they're not going to get an education. They're going to starve. They're going to die. Something bad's going to happen to you. Vote to raise your own taxes. And we all go, oh, yeah, absolutely. Just, oh, my God. Yeah. We can't let that happen. Guilt is an incredibly powerful tool, which is used against them constantly. The, the giving pledge, if you read it, filled with the idea of guilt. There's the, there's the notion in America, I don't know if they use it in, in the UK, of giving back. As if you took something. As if there's a zero-sum game here. As if you didn't create this massive amount of wealth for everybody else. You have to give back somehow. You've already given and given and given and given. And now they want more. So we live with a moral code that is antagonistic to the very function of an entrepreneur. That's antagonistic to the very function of business. We don't respect them. We don't ultimately admire them. We condemn them. We tax them to death. Right? The Trump now is uh, we're unleashing the new tax plan. Right? And uh, we're going to lower everybody's taxes except anybody who's successful. We can't lower their taxes. So the top marginal rate is not moving. There's actually talk about increasing it. By the other tax cuts, they're sold and I'd like to save money anyway. So. They're going to save a little bit of money, but they're taking deductions away, so they'll actually land up, the top marginal tax rate will probably land up paying more, not less. And if you cut corporate taxes, one of the great myths about corporate taxes is if you cut corporate taxes, it's not shareholders who benefit. Who benefits when you cut corporate taxes? Workers. Workers and consumers. So corporate taxes are a tax on employment. And a, and a sales tax on consumer goods. So everybody 
who thinks that the Wall Street is going up right now because corporate taxes can come down, there are two options. One, that's just not true. Wall Street's going up for other reasons. Second, if it is true, then Wall Street's going to be very disappointed when profits don't increase because profits don't go up when you cut capital gains tax, uh, corporate taxes. Prices go down and wages go up. So it's a great thing to cut corporate taxes, but it's not the rich who benefit. So what's the solution? The solution, in my view, is to rethink our approach to morality, to rethink our approach to ethics. To ask the question that Ayn Rand asks. She asks, why should you be selfless? Why should you care more for others than you do for yourself? Why is their happiness more important than your happiness? The solution to our attitude towards entrepreneurs and ultimately our attitudes towards capitalism and our attitudes towards freedom depend on the morality that we hold, on the moral code that we believe in. Look, we, the free market, people who believe in free markets, we won the economic debate decades ago with Mises and Hayek. We won it. Capitalism works. Business creates wealth. Entrepreneurs produce. We have all the concrete evidence in the world for the success of capitalism, for the success of free markets. All you have to do is open your eyes, study a little bit of history, and it's right there in front of you. The value of businessmen and entrepreneurs to our lives is obvious every day as we consume, use the, the, the stuff that they made possible, from the iPhone to our refrigerators to, to everything that we have. There are apartments that were built by contractors who are entrepreneurs as well. But we don't think in those terms. Why? Because we're conditioned by our morality to not trust anything that is tinged with self-interest. We're, we're conditioned by our morality to be suspicious of people that are making money. We hate profit because our moral code tells us to hate profit. There's no economic argument against profit. No legitimate one. And the ones that were made in the past have all been refuted. So the only thing, in my view, that is holding back the success of free markets, of capitalism, of freedom in the world, is an ancient, decadent, anti-life, anti-individualist morality. Because the options are not be moral and therefore take care of others and be altruistic and love thy neighbor like yourself and you know, you're your brother's keeper and everything else, that's morality and then the alternative is lying, cheating, stealing, SOB, selfish bastard. That's not the choices we have. There's a third alternative, which is what? To be truly selfish. And truly selfish means what? What does it mean to be selfish? It means taking care of self. Placing one's own well-being as our primary concern. Without the karma at the expense of others. To hell with that. Because it turns out that when you act to exploit other people, when you act to lie, steal, cheat, and do all that things, you're not working in your own self-interest. You're actually destroying your own self-interest. You're destroying your self-esteem. You're destroying... Your pride. You make it impossible for yourself to achieve the real self-esteem that a person who's self-interested can achieve. You cannot be happy exploiting other people. And you can ask me in the Q&A for examples if we have any time. Have I run over? Okay, so let me, so, uh, let me try to wrap up and then we'll have some questions. Um, to be self-interested is to take seriously one's own life. It's to live the best life that you can live for yourself. It's to target your own success, your own happiness, your own flourishing as a human being. And what's the one thing that makes all that possible for human beings? What do entrepreneurs rely on 
to build the businesses to make to create these values? What do we all rely on in order to live and thrive and succeed? Capital. Ten. Capital. Capital. Before capital. By the way, where does where does the word capital come from? <coughs> What's that? Yes. In that sense, that's the right term. Capital comes from what? Das from the capital. mind. What's that? The term capital comes from das Kapital. It's been kind of an insult. No, das Kapital, the word capital predates. Capitalism is a word that Marx coined. And I think there were actually people before Marx. But Marx was very popular. But what is the word capital comes from, the word, from a word in Latin, I think, that means the human mind. No? Where does the word capital come from? He's shaking his head. Okay. I think it's head. Uh, head. What's that? Head. head. Yes. Which means what's in the head, because it's, it's not head, empty head. Uh, <laughs> what makes human life possible? What ha makes human success possible? What every entrepreneur in the world relies on is what? It's not capital, it's not customers. Way before capital, way before customers. Trade or money? It, before trade, before money. Other people. Reason. Other people, no, but you have to have an idea. You have to have a plan. Where does that come from? Your mind. Your mind. Every entrepreneur starts with an idea. Every entrepreneur starts with real, tough, extensive thinking. It's all about thinking. It's all about using your mind to figure stuff out. It's not, Steve Jobs didn't need capital to create this. He needed an idea, he needed a vision. And, they need, and it's lots of ideas, right? Because it's not just the idea of what this will look like or what this will do, but how do you build it? How do you create it? Who do you hire? Where do you get the capital? All this stuff requires thought. All of human life requires thought. Everything we have around us is a product of the human mind. We don't generate this stuff from emotion. It doesn't come from mystical revelation. This comes from using your mind, using your reason, discovering truth, discovering fact, Figuring it out, laying out a plan, and then executing the plan. And even executing the plan requires communicating appropriately with others, describing it to them, relies on their mind, because they're going to have to execute on this. It's the human mind that lays at the heart of all human activity. And it's the human mind that is at the core of what it means to be self-interested. If you want to live a good life, if you want to flourish as a human being, if you want to be successful as a human being, what you need to cultivate is your reasoning capability. What you need to cultivate is not the ability to lie, cheat, and steal, but it's the ability to think. It's the ability to create and produce based on those thoughts. It's the ability to live based on your rational reasoning mind. So it's not about being selfless or being an SOB. It's about using your mind to live the most effective life that you can live for yourself. And if, you, if we viewed morality as about that, just imagine a world that viewed morality as about virtue, nobility, a people who use their mind to create and to build and make stuff. What would that make entrepreneurs? Heroes, saints. Steve Jobs and Bill Gates are saints in my moral code. Not because they give any money away, but because they create the money. Because they create the values. Because they use their minds to make their lives better. Their lives exciting. Their lives interesting. And we all benefited from that. Cool. But they not heroes because they made our lives better. They're heroes because they made their lives better. They actually lived. They made something in their lives. There are lots of people out there who are alive technically, but are not living. Life is to be lived. You got one shot at it. And to do that, it's the mind that must be cultivated. So morality that holds the sanctity of the mind, the sanctity of the individual, that holds 
that to be moral is to pursue one's own rational, long-term self-interest is a morality that admires and respects and holds a saintly what entrepreneurs and business people do. And a morality like that, if people actually held it, then free markets is easy. Because it's the only kind of world you would want to live in. Where nobody was an authority over your mind. Where nobody told you, oh, you can't build that. You have to get a permit. Who the hell are you to give me a permit? Who, what, what have you got? Because some government brute, you know, assigned you to some committee, you get to decide what I build and what I don't build. Nobody with self-esteem who has a morality of self-interest would allow for the kind of bureaucratic nonsense that we have today. Freedom is obvious once you have that self-esteem. Once you want to live your life for yourself based on your own mind. You don't accept authority. So for freedom to be successful, for entrepreneurs ultimately to flourish, I believe what we need is a moral revolution. So I encourage you, I know that some of you picked up The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand. I encourage you to study the morality of freedom, the morality of capitalism, the morality of entrepreneurship. And I think the only person to really <coughs> present the case for the morality of capitalism and morality of the individual is Ayn Rand. So read Ayn Rand. Thank you all. Questions. First of all, Dr. Burke, thank you for, for an excellent presentation. An observation for the members of the audience. It would be very interesting if you haven't read the history of cellular technology to realize just how long government intervention prevented cellular technology from taking hold in the world. We would have actually had mobile phones readily available at a much lower cost 40 years ago if it had not been for explicit government. Where, where can you read about that? Thomas Hazlett who used to work for the FEC, wrote an article, I think, for Reason Magazine. Okay. I'll be happy to, to, to make it available to those. Allow me to offer a suggestion. My, my friend Michael Cloud uh, has a, a saying, and the older I get, the more I think it's valuable. Obvious means overlooked. That it's precisely, in many ways, people overlook the extraordinary accomplishments of the human mind. I relieved myself in one of these lovely facilities here. Uh, I think it was a man named Thomas Cracker who invented the flush toilet. Yep. We take it for granted the extraordinary, extraordinary impact of being able to dispose of human waste in a, in a nice fa fashion. If you get in parts of the world where yeah, they don't I was, I was going to say, if you travel in rural China, you suddenly discover. If you walked, if you walked along the strand and you saw a picture of Joseph Lister, a man who invented the basically or antiseptic way of operating so that far fewer people died. Most people don't have any knowledge of yep. history, and that is obvious means overlooked. But, but that, and that's absolutely right. And, but what's tragic, and what's not tragic, criminal, is that we don't teach it. We don't even try, right? So, first of all, the 19th century is kind of brushed over quickly in history classes. When I think it's the most important the most important century in human history, right? The rest of human history is boring, nothing happens, right? I mean, really, in a sense of material wealth, nothing happens. We die in our 30s during the rest of it, and suddenly something amazing happens, and we don't teach it. I mean, that's stunning to me. And then when we do teach it, what do we teach? Oh, there was child labor in the Industrial Revolution. You Brits really abused your children. What did children do before the Industrial Revolution? They died working. They didn't die in bed. They died working. Every child worked on the farm from sunrise to sunset. And they, most of them, over 50%, died before they were age 10. That was life. And yet, we're obsessed about the short period of time when they worked in factories. And why did they stop working in factories? Because the government bailed them out? Why did they stop working in factories? Because the, the laws were always passed after the phenomenon had already gone away. So why? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever managed people. But if you have, imagine managing 12-year-olds. It's not, it's not efficient. It's not productive. They're not 
good employees. That's one reason. The second reason is parents became rich enough to be able to feed their kids without the kids working. No parent wants their kid to work if there's an alternative. The reason children work is because they have to feed themselves. So as soon as the parents got rich enough, which is what the Industrial Revolution created, to take the kids out of the factories and send them to school, they sent them to school. The 19th century is a period in which we ended slavery. Capitalism ended slavery. It's the British and ultimately the Americans, after a pretty bloody civil war, that ended slavery. The most capitalist countries in the world. It is, I mean, but none of that is studied. None of that is talked about. It's the pollution and the child labor and all the nonsense that people want to focus on. Right? And now in China, people obsess. All the, whenever I mention China, they say, oh, but the air is so polluted in Beijing. Who the hell cares? A billion people have just come out of poverty. We should be dancing in the streets. A billion people are not poor anymore. So there's a little pollution in there. Who the fuck cares? I mean, it's mind-boggling to me when a little story about the pollution completely blinds people to the real story in the world. You know how many people today, we talked about the $3 a day, under $3, how many people today in the world, what percentage of the population today in the world lives under $3 a day? It used to be 95%. What is it today? It's under 10%. It's, under 10%. it's 8 30 years ago, what was it? 30 it's gone from 30 to 8 in 30 years. That is stunning. So much good stuff has happened to people over the last 30 years. In India, in China, in South Korea, in Taiwan, in all over Asia and even parts of Africa. We should be celebrating. Oh no, but there's pollution in Beijing. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we don't study it and we don't have the right perspective. Either. Somewhat, without, huh? without, without uh, creating any value at all. Yep. So that, that was pure rent seeking, and, and that's been basically in, in no small part because of uh, due to the uh, property system of property rights uh, bequeathed to us by those horrible aristocrats upon which has been layered the Industrial Revolution. So if we still do have that kind of feudalism bubbling on underneath. I don't believe property rights are feudalism. So property rights are, 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 are legitimate. You, you supposedly, or somebody supposedly, owned uh, the wealth that was required to buy that house. And the reason you sold it for so much more than what you bought it at is because of the stupid housing policies that the British government has today and that, the London, that London administers. Housing overall, on average, housing prices should never rise. In a free market, they never would because it's a consumer good. As soon as you move into that, just like as soon as you buy a car, its price drops. As soon as you drive it off the lot, same with the house. It's a consumer good. You, you, it, it's, it's deteriorating every day you live in it. It's not rising in price, right? But because we have constrained the supply of housing, the supply of the, the existing stock of housing rises in prices. It's all government intervention. In, in the, uh, uh, why, why don't you, outside of, like the other side of the river, why don't you build high rises all over, all over London, you know, w w with condominiums, given, given how much, uh, because, because the royal family and others who own a lot of the housing and a lot of the Russians or whoever own a lot of the expensive housing don't want you to lower the price of housing in London. They want to keep it high, and they want to keep it higher. Keep going, right? So there's huge special interests within the city of London to try to make sure that housing prices never come down because they'll, they're benefiting from it. Sorry, just last point on that. Yeah. So but it doesn't that taint the, the, you're saying why the businesses get such a bad name, but that is partly why you get to make No, none of those, none of those are businesses. Not, I mean, there's a certain element that businesses lobby government and get favors from the government and they get a bad name, right? 
But let's, let's take that apart. Let's deconstruct that for a second. Right? And my favorite story about that is, is Microsoft. And I, I, I'll get to that in a second. But the only reason businesses lobby government and get favors is because government has power over them. <coughs> the injustice is the power over the businesses. So if, if you have power over me, I'm going to find a way to get on your good side and try to get favors from you. Because otherwise, I don't know what you're going to do to me, because you have power over me. The, the evil is not the lobby. The evil is the very fact that government has anything to give these businesses. And I'll give you the, the Microsoft example. It's such a classic, and it's a true story. So. So in the 90s, in the early 90s, Microsoft spent exactly zero dollars on lobbying. No lobbying. No law firms in Washington. No building in Washington. No presence in Washington. Nothing. Right? They stayed away. They were in Seattle. It was far away. They didn't have to be in Washington. And they were brought in front of the Senate. Owen Hatch, who is a well-known senator, he's still in the Senate, Republican from Utah, stood up and yelled at them. You guys have to be in Washington. You have to start lobbying. You got to get a law firm. You should build a building in Washington, D.C. You have to have a presence here. In other words, you got to bribe me. Otherwise, he didn't say that otherwise, but it was implied. Microsoft says in the meeting, they, they go, we're not interested. You leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. Right? Walked out. No change in their lobbying policy. Six months later, Knock on the door in Seattle. We're from the Justice Department. And you're in violation of antitrust. What was the violation? Process What's that? They were spelling Internet Explorer. They were giving Internet Explorer away for free. Bundling, whatever the hell that means, right? With Windows. And Netscape didn't like that. Because Netscape, I, you guys are too young to remember this, but we used to buy our browsers. So Netscape was the, the big game in town. You used to, I think it was 60, 70 bucks to buy a browser, to browse the internet. Microsoft gave it away for free. That was a violation of antitrust laws. So what did Microsoft learn from that experience? What do you think? It, it, they were in court for 10 years. After that 10 years, they had a uh, government-appointed bureaucrat sitting in the headquarters in Redmond, Washington, of Microsoft signing off on every dis corporate decision Microsoft made how to have the bureaucrats sign off. Those 15 years were years of no innovation. Microsoft used to be the biggest company in the world, the most innovative, exciting company in the world, and it become nothing, or well, almost nothing. Today. What did they learn from? Lobby, lobby, lobby. You better get in these people's faces. So now they spend tens of millions of dollars a year lobbying. They have a magnificent building in Washington, D.C., like equal distance from the White House and from Congress. So that focus, I, and I don't blame Microsoft for lobbying. And by the way, what did Google learn? But Google watched this very early on. And they said, we don't want to, never want to be Microsoft. We don't never want the government to come after us. So what did they do? They started spreading money around from day one. They, they, they paid off all the politicians in the U.S. They forgot about Europe. They forgot to lobby in Europe, so Europe went after them. But the evil is the power we give our politicians. The evil is the power we give the bureaucrats. Not the, the, the business lobbying. They're just trying to defend themselves. And yes, once you, once you start that process and you, and you get lawyers involved, you're always going to overstep your bounds and start accusing other, you know, using government to oppress your, your competitors, and all of that happens, and that's bad. But that all gets set in motion because of the power we have given the government. So I advocate for complete separation of economics from politics. Government should have no power over business. And as a consequence, business would have no interest in the government. That's not um, to 
Yeah, I mean, I think she would. Because you're placing your feelings as a primary. Why do you feel that way is the question. Why do you feel good by helping other people? Now, I'm not saying that's illegitimate, but I'm saying you should have an explanation for it. Again, she would say everything needs to be guided by reason. So if I'm helping somebody and it makes me feel good, is that feeling coming from some other morality that's been taught to me by my parents or my priests? Does it feel good because I feel guilty about the wealth I've created and I'm giving it away in order to appease that guilt? Why am I feeling good is important because if the feelings are based on illegitimate evaluations, feelings are not in a vacuum. Feelings come from past conclusions and thinking that we've done. And feelings can sometimes be indicate that our thinking in the past has been wrong. So if I feel good by giving something to somebody I shouldn't feel good about giving to, then I should question you know, what conclusions I came to. Let's be clear, Rand was not against charity. What she said was, when you give charity, give to things that you believe in, that are values to you, that make you feel good because you understand why you're giving it. So yeah, she would say, help a friend out. Absolutely. Because he's a friend. Not because he might help you in the future. That's the kind of trading she would she would find strange. No, because he's a value to you. His happiness is important to your happiness because he's a friend. Why would you give to a stranger? Well, because maybe you have a lot of money and the stranger seems like a nice person and uh, they might be productive in their lives and there's some benefit to you, but you have to have a reason. And you can certainly have reasons to be charitable. But there's certain people I would never give money to because it would be against my self-interest. So Rand's not against kindness. She's not against opening doors to old ladies, for old ladies to walk. She's not against charity. She's certainly not against helping your friends. She, all she's saying is make sure that it's rational and make sure that in the big picture it's in your self-interest to do so. Not in a narrow sense of materialistic self-interest, but in a broad sense. And not based on just your feelings, based on understanding where those feelings come from, where your emotions come from, and whether they're legitimate emotions or not legitimate emotions. The emotion itself is what it is. It's the reasoning that created that emotion might be legitimate or illegitimate. He's cutting me off. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Oh, thank you.